Those of you who know me know I'm a patriot. I served my country in the United States Army. I served the Defense Department as a civilian intelligence officer. I got to raise my hand twice and swore to defend my country against all enemies, foreign domestic. Proud of that. I also served those who served. I was able to um, work with veterans for about seven and a half years. I love this country. I love what it stands for, even though it's done imperfectly. I, I love that we are for liberty and freedom and equality and all those different things. And on 4th of July, those are the things we think about on Independence Day. But I'm going to talk to you about something different today. I want to talk to you about true freedom. You see, our freedoms don't come from the Constitution. Our freedoms don't come from the government. Our freedoms don't come from the rights that we all think we have. That is all worldly stuff. That's not where our freedom comes from as Christians. And unfortunately, in this day and age, some people are confusing that. Some people have fallen into this trap of what we call Christian nationalism, which I think is an oxymoron, because you're trying to mix spiritual things with worldly things. I want to talk today about spiritual things, about true freedom and where that comes from. I'm going to land today on John 8, verses 31 and 32. We're going to talk about what Jesus said. So follow with me. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, he is with a large group of people and he's been preaching to them in John 8 and they're believing in him. He says this, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, you know this verse. If you abide in my word, if you abide, if you abide. You are truly a disciple then. That's awesome. And when you're truly a disciple, you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm going to land on two words today. I'm going to land on truth and free and talk about what that means within the context of Scripture. Sometimes when you're doing uh, uh, exegesis, is what they call this, when you're studying Scripture, you allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And that's what we're going to do a little bit of it today. So... Enjoy this. The two words, truth and free. Truth is a Greek word, obviously, because we're in the New Testament. Aleatheia is how it's pronounced. And it's used 110 times in Scripture, 110 times. And how vines, which is a dictionary for, for biblical words, how vines describes it is this. Truth is used objectively, signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance. You see what you get, right? Truth is a hard thing to define, though. When you read that, you go, what? What is truth? See, in today's world, isn't truth everyone has their own truth? Haven't you heard these people say things like, oh, you know, you need to tell your truth, as if everyone has a different truth? What truth is, is an objective standard of reality. And that's what Jesus was talking about. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, the objective reality. So what is truth? What is truth? In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Remember, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple. You are truly my disciple. So in the beginning, Jesus was the word, right? In John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. So we know that from these two verses from John, that Jesus is the Word and that He was full of grace and truth. Jesus is the objective reality. In John 14.6, He says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, Jesus is the truth. So when we say from that John 8 verse 31, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, you need to know Jesus. And I'm not just talking about this intellectual understanding that Jesus lived and died, was crucified, or even if you're a believer that he was, was put in a tomb and was raised and resurrected on the third day. I, I'm not talking about that kind of head knowledge. I'm talking about spiritual heart knowledge, emotional knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because that's what he's talking about. Objective truth is God's word. 
This is what Jesus says. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one of the smallest letters or least stroke of the pen, or in some in translations you'll see not one jot or one tittle, will be any means by any means disappear from the law until all is accomplished. Let me say that again. Until heaven and earth disappear. You know where you see that? In Revelation, when the new heaven and new earth are created. The word is the word, the objective truth of God, the absolute truth is God's word, embodied in Jesus Christ. So you want to know the truth and you want to be set free, true freedom? It's the word. It's Jesus. So what is truth? What is truth for us today, uh, you know, sitting at home, sitting in the sanctuary? What is the truth? Truth is this. You have to recognize your own sinful condition because that is truth. All fall short of the glory of God, Scripture tells us. Not one is righteous. Not one, Scripture tells us. We all need a Savior. Every single one of us. Here's another piece of truth. Salvation only comes through Jesus' sacrificial propitiation, paying the price on the cross for the sins of the world to reconcile the world to himself. That's a truth. Salvation only comes through Jesus. Remember, you only get to the Father through the Son. Nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. The gate is narrow. And you know what it says after that? People forget this. The gate is narrow. And few find it. Few find it. It says, on that day, many will call me Lord, Lord, and I'll say, I never knew you. You know why? Because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They didn't really know the truth of the word because they don't believe in the absolute word of God. They don't believe what the scriptures say uh, in places because it's uncomfortable or it's not culturally acceptable. They throw all that out, but they love Jesus. I have friends that tell me, well, I know people that are better Christians than Christians. And I just, I just shake my head and most of the time walk off. They may be the nicest people in the world. They may give to philanthropy. They may you know, be the most loving, caring people you ever met. But they don't think they need a savior. They don't understand their condition. And that's why they're going to hell. Because you can't work your way to a holy God. Which is why Jesus had to pay the price and is the propitiation for our sins. What else is truth? God gives us grace through faith if we love Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do as I command. If you love me, you'll do as I command. Remember he said, if you abide in my word, if you do what I command, you are truly my disciple. I will abide in you, Jesus tells us. And we're supposed to abide in him because he says without doing that, we are nothing. It's so important. I've been preaching about this a lot lately. You will know that people are his disciples by the way they love one another and the fruit they bear. Jesus says a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit and a bad tree doesn't bear good fruit. Really simple stuff. But the church has kind of lost sight of some of these things because it doesn't like the truth. You know, truth is hard. Truth isn't all, uh, you know, sugar plums and fairies. Truth is reality. And as a Christian, our reality is there is a Father in heaven, creator, who is to be feared, because that's the first part of wisdom. He is awesome. He loves us, but he's God. Truth is, Jesus died on a cross for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God, and the curse could be lifted. The truth is what God says is true. His absolute moral truths Never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's truth. And those outside the church don't believe that, and those, some of those inside the church don't believe that. But it doesn't change the truth being the truth. Let's talk about the next word, free. The word is eleithero. That's a tough word. And it's only used seven times. This was, it was fascinating when I was looking at this. I expected 100, 150 times. You'd figure the word free, freedom would be used a lot. Nope, seven times. And the definition is freedom to go wherever one likes, freedom from restraint and obligation. But I like this one. It is to be delivered or deliverance. Well, you got to ask yourself a question when you start talking about freedom from things or deliverance from something. From what? Right? 
In Galatians 5, first verse, it says this, It is for the freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. What, what's Jesus talking about, or Paul talking about? Paul's talking about the, the law. We are free from the law. We have been freed from the idea that it's about your performance. And that somehow or another, you can be righteous in your own work. That was never the plan. Remember Abraham? Abraham was considered righteous because of his faithfulness. Not because he worked. Not because he kept a series of laws. See, the laws of God are meant so that we, his people, can have the best possible life we can have. But it became so legalistic by the Pharisees and all that, they missed the point. See, God loves his children and he doesn't want us to be harmed. He doesn't want us to harm each other. So he puts these moral absolutes in place saying, don't do this. It's bad for you. That is freedom. But men created a system out of it that was bondage. And Jesus came and he said, you got it wrong. It's not about your performance because you can never perform well enough anyway. It's about your faith, just like Abraham. And that's the truth that will set you free. So what are we free from? We're free from prejudice and hate. Scripture tells us the greatest commandment is to love God and love each other, right? That's what Jesus said. The greatest commandment is love God, love each other. If you do that, you won't hate anybody. You will have no prejudices. Doesn't matter people's skin color, doesn't matter their origin, doesn't matter uh, anything about their background. You just love people. Doesn't matter what they've done in life. That doesn't mean you accept all their actions. You still correct and do the right things in love. But you don't have prejudice and hate. And if you see a Christian who has prejudice and hate, they're not in the faith. John tells us that if you don't love your brother who you've seen, but say you love God who you've not seen, you're a liar. What else are we set free from? Division and isolation. Scripture tells us, be of one mind, that of Christ. We as the body of Christ are supposed to be of one mind. Paul tells us, don't fight over silly theological things that don't matter. Focus on Jesus. We're set free from hatred and bitterness. Scripture says, forgive as you've been forgiven. The most bitter you can ever be is when someone does you wrong and you don't forgive them. You've been forgiven as a gift from God, by grace, you need to show that same grace and forgiveness to others. We're not supposed to judge people. You want to, you want to you know, eliminate that bitterness from your life? Don't judge anybody. You don't know their story. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. Don't take offense about stuff. I mean, this, this culture is the most offended culture ever in the history of mankind, I think. Don't take offense, Jesus tells us. He says, bear with each other. That's how you are free from hatred and bitterness in Christ. Hostility and war. You know, Scripture says, so long as it depends on you, be peaceful. We're free from hostility and war because as far as it depends on us, we're to be peaceful. And in 99.9% .9 of the situations, we can be peaceful. We're, we're set free from assault and killing. Thou shalt not commit murder. We're set free from it because we're, we're, Jesus says, look, I'm, when you come to me and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you're going to change. You're not going to hate your brother. You're not going to feel bitterness. You're not going to be angered. You're not going to have all these emotions that are out of control. You're, you're going to have contentment and peace and joy and patience and goodness and kindness, right? The spiritual fruit. You're not going to feel like doing that to people. You're free from committing crimes and injustices because Scripture says obey the government. We just went through that, right, with this whole masky thing? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll just tell you the truth. I'm not a big mask fan, right? I, I didn't take the COVID shot for a long time because I didn't think I needed it. My wife's a nurse, and I like to have a place to live, so I took it. But I don't think I had to. But you know why I did all this? I have to obey the government. Scripture says very clearly to do that. And so long as they're not interfering on my ability to worship God, I have to do that because Scripture says so. It's pretty simple. We're free from enslavement and abuses. You know, Scripture says this. It says, there is no Greek, there is no Jew, there is no man, there is no woman, there is no free, there is no slave. We're all the same under Christ. It's unity. 
We're set free from emptiness and loneliness. We are one body in Christ that is filled with the Holy Spirit. You, you never have to be lonely. And we're certainly freed from fear and death. In this world, Jesus said, we will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know what? You don't have to be selfish. Scripture says, in all things, consider others better than yourself. To be a leader, you have to serve, right? All of these things we're set free from. We are delivered from our fleshly desire to act out in our fallen emotions. And instead, we have the, in, the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that guides us and teaches us and shows us and grows us to the point where we can treat others the way Jesus treats them. That's powerful, my friends. You're delivered from the bondage of sin. You're seen as holy and righteous through the blood of Jesus. God, when he looks at you, doesn't see a sinner. Remember, he says, I will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus removed our sins. God sees us as holy and righteous, as saints, as adopted sons and daughters, as heirs to the, to the, to the throne. My goodness. We are delivered from judgment. People don't preach about this anymore because it's not popular. People don't like fire and brimstone sermons. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't know the truth, you are not set free. And what you are set free from is hell. Jesus' propitiation on a cross, his payment for our sins on a cross, set us free from hell because we know the truth that I need a savior. I need salvation. I am a sinner. That's why I'm truly free. John 8, 36 says this, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. See what he did there? He, he, he said Moses gave us the law to try to keep us in the lane, tell us the absolute rights and wrongs, but Jesus came with truth and grace. John 1, 17 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you abide in his word, <laughs> you are truly his disciple. And that truth of that will set you free. So, freedom is not fireworks on the 4th of July. Freedom is not understanding your constitution and demanding your rights for the First and Second Amendment, having a judiciary that does uh, uh, due process under the Fourth, Fifth, and Fourteenth Amendment. I mean, that's all great stuff, but that is all worldly stuff. And we are to hate the world. Love of the world is enmity toward God, we're told by John. We are supposed to, to pick up our cross and bear it daily. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. We are not supposed to be people that grab onto this world and love things about it. We are citizens of heaven. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. So it doesn't matter what country you're in. We were blessed, those of us born in America. At this time, God placed us here. We are truly blessed to have a country where I can worship and preach and do everything I want. But that is no difference between me, a Christian in Salem, Oregon, and a Christian in Beijing, China. Or a Christian in Somalia, or Uganda, or Guatemala, or Russia. We're all the same, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our freedom comes through Jesus, not our circumstances. It doesn't matter what race you are, what social economic status you have, it does, none of that matters. When you look around your congregation, I hope you see a lot of diversity. Diversity in race, diversity in age, diversity in experience. Because Jesus died for all of us. One died for all. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And he died to give us freedom. Freedom from being unable to meet the requirements of holiness and thus earning ourselves hell. That is true freedom. And when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. 
Jesus is the word made flesh. He is full of grace and truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the propitiation for our sins. He loves us so much, he died on a cross so he could spend eternity with us. So how will the truth set you free? How about judge not? How about forgive as you've been forgiven? How about turn the other cheek? How about, how about this? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How about humble yourselves? How about go and make disciples? How about serve somebody? You live in that truth and it will fundamentally change your life. God is good, my friends. And Jesus wants you to know on this 4th of July and every day that he is freedom. It is through Jesus Christ, our Messiah, through his blood, that we have freedom. Now, I'm not saying don't enjoy 4th of July. Enjoy 4th of July, have a picnic, have a barbecue, eat some hot dogs. But don't confuse the two. You owe your life to Jesus. Revel in the freedom you have in him. And all God's people said, amen. The gospel, the good news. What does that mean? You know, we're told to preach the gospel every day, use words if we have to. I like that one. The gospel, the good news. The good news is we're not going to hell. There's a book out there called 23 Minutes in Hell. I forget the writer. But he was a pastor who Jesus showed one night in a vision what hell was like. The book is terrifying. Matter of fact, when I got done reading the book, I was so struck to evangelize, I would not want my worst enemy going to hell after what I read. And we don't have to. Come all ye who are burdened. The invitation to Jesus is for everyone, and it's an open door. It's tragic that people reject it. It's been happening since Jesus walked the earth. But the night that he was with his disciples before his trials and, and his crucifixion, and that Passover meal, he first said, I'm eagerly willing, wanting to do this. I eagerly want to have this meal with you. But he wanted them to remember him. When you do this, he said, which was to break the bread and take the cup, do this in remembrance of me. Well, what are we remembering? I think a couple things. We're remembering the good news. We're remembering that because of what Jesus did, I'm not going to hell for my sins. As unrighteous and sinful as I am, the blood of Jesus covers me. His grace is sufficient. The Father sees me as holy and righteous through Jesus because I'm his. So we celebrate remembering him because I'm not going to hell. That's not where I'm spending my eternity. I'm not spending my eternity in torment separated from God. That is good news. We celebrate the truth. He died, was buried, and he was resurrected. The first to be resurrected bodily. The promise was kept. He overcame death, which means we, his disciples, also overcome death. Paul says to be out of the bodies, to be with Christ. Our last breath on this earth, our first breath in heaven, and we will be bodily resurrected at the end of days. That's also good news. We remember the lessons he taught. He says, if you love me, you'll do as I command. Jesus taught us all sorts of things that are counterculture. And we're supposed to remember that. Most of all, we're supposed to remember that Jesus is our friend. We are supposed to have a relationship with him. And we think about what he suffered for us. And so today, as we do this in remembrance of him, we remember what he said. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this every time you eat. Let's remember what Jesus went through. 
broken body and all, so that we could be with him forever. Let us eat. The same way he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. What do you mean by that? You know, he gave his, his, his disciples a new command at the very end. He said, I give you a new command. You are to love each other as I have loved you. The old command was love others as, as you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Now it was, no, no, you've got to love others the way I love you, sacrificially. You, you are supposed to love others the way Jesus loved, which is sacrificially. So when he says, this is the new covenant in my blood, he's saying, the law is done. It's not about your performance, which you could never meet anyway. It's now about your faith. And I will give you the Holy Spirit to guide and teach and reveal and do all the things the Holy Spirit does in power in us. And you will have spiritual fruit, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. You are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that Jesus has taught you. That's the mission. And that's what we're to remember today, communion, as we drink. We remember that Jesus died on a cross so that we today, 2,000 years later, can go share Jesus with people so they don't go to hell either. Let me pray over this. Father, I just thank you so much for your son Jesus and what he did and what it means. I ask, Lord, that all Christians not just our congregation, not just our churches in Salem, not just the church, but everyone out there who at some point or another accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior understands, understands just what Jesus did and our responsibility to it. Thank you, Jesus, for your love of us and the sacrifice you made. Amen. Let us drink. Amen. All right, we're going to wrap up today with a Skit Guys prayer. Uh, it is 4th of July, and the Skit Guys put together, I think, what is a really nice prayer. So we'll use this as our ending prayer today, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy a really great 4th of July long weekend, and that uh, um, you remember some of the stuff we talked about today. And you maybe reevaluate where you are in terms of where you think your freedom comes from. And if you get to the place where I am, where your freedom on this 4th of July comes from Jesus and Jesus alone, I think you'll enjoy your 4th even better. God bless.